Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. And this will be on the small bowel, but the topic is something that we commonly or maybe uncommonly see, but more commonly miss. Now, that seems very complicated, what I said to you, but when we think about the small bowel, we think about Crohn's disease, we think about um, sprue, we think about tumors. But there are many things in the small bowel that are a result of different therapies, whether it's drug therapy, whether it's radiation therapy, whether it's chemotherapy. And these can be symptomatic and can present with symptoms such as acute abdomen or GI bleeding. And yet we often don't think about them. So in this talk, what I'd like to do is really go through a couple of these, show you some nice examples and talk about this. And I could look at many different things, both in large and small bowel, but we're going to look at the small bowel only. And I picked four topics. One was post bone marrow transplant or graft versus host disease. One is post chemotherapy for a range of tumors. One is post radiation therapy. And then the final one, which is outside the oncology realm, is one of the medications, ACE inhibitors, which can also present with an acute abdomen. And unless you think about this, you're not going to make the diagnosis to the patient. And the patient can end up in the OR or admitted, while all the patient needs to do is stop taking the ACE inhibitor. So let's look at some of the challenges. Well, as always, the challenges typically relate to history. If someone gave you the full history, perhaps you would know the answer. But also, perhaps you don't think about it. Maybe you don't pay attention to the fact that patients post bone marrow transplant, and that this could be graft versus host disease because it's rule out appendicitis. Perhaps the clinical history is very long, and it's difficult to really focus on a specific organ involvement that might relate to the clinical history. Perhaps the primary disease process may be masquerading treatment effects. So patient maybe is doing poorly, you're worrying about tumor recurrence. You're not thinking about one of the other processes. So there's many things. And of course, the imaging findings at times can be suggestive. Like, for example, when you think about the uh, cecum being markedly thickened, you go through a long differential diagnosis. But if you knew the patient was immunosuppressed, then you would say something like tiflitis, which is an overgrowth of bacteria typically causing it. Or if you saw very large, thickened, large bowel folds and it's involving an entire colon and has an accordion type appearance, then you're thinking about pseudomembranous colitis, which is a consequence of antibiotic use. But again, those are large bowel. Let's only focus on small bowel issues, okay? So let's do that. Here's a great case, abdominal pain. And you're looking and you're saying, aha, the patient has thickening of small bowel loops distally. When you look at more images, and I'm gonna show you a number of images, you see a halo. Now you see a long segment of bowel. It's not just terminal ileum, it's more of the ileum. It's fairly extensive. There's also some induration in the mesenteric fat. There's mucosal hyperenhancement, there's submucosal edema, and what typically what we would call in cross-section a halo sign. Here it is very nicely on the coronal view. You could think of this, could this be ischemia in the right history? But the vessels look pretty good, so that's not going to be a likely scenario. But you can see how extensive this process is. Here it is in the 3D, again, nicely showing you the prominent vessels, the vasorecta to the bowel. When we think of vasorecta to small bowel, we always think about Crohn's disease. But one would have to admit this is fairly extensive for Crohn's disease. But again, Crohn's is one of the things that gives you a target sign. And again, here's a few more images of that. And as we go from arterial to venous, again, beautiful example of target sign. So again, you're thinking, what could this be? Long, extensive bowel loops, fairly symmetric, mucosal enhancement, submucosa edema, stranding in the mesentery, very long segment involvement. And you're going through ischemia is too extensive. Crohn's doesn't, it's more than just a terminal ileum. It's just too long for Crohn's disease. Could this be infectious? You think about things like salmonella, which involved the ileum. It really doesn't look like this. Could it be ischemia? Well, you look at the vessels, the vessels look too good. Beautifully shown again on the cinematic rendering. So what are we thinking about? 
What gives you very long segments of bowel involvement, extensive mucosal enhancement, the target sign? What should we be thinking about? Well, let's look at it in its entirety. We can even, I'll even take advantage and show you as we th scroll through the data sets. Really, really impressive look at the bowel. Indeed, very, very impressive what you're dealing with. So what, what, what are we thinking here? Are you thinking about something like Crohn's disease? I don't know. It just looks too extensive for that. What else could this be? And I think now you got to go back and really look carefully at the history. Is this patient on any specific medications? Is this patient on Coumadin? Could this be bleeding into bowel? It really doesn't look like bleeding into bowel. What are we thinking about? Well, when you look at the history, this patient has a history of multiple myeloma, has had a bone marrow transplant, and what this is is graft-versus-host disease. Now, graft-versus-host disease, you remember way back when, uh, when bone marrow transplants first came along, it was one of the most difficult uh, problems for patients. Now it's much less frequently due to better drugs. Remember way back when on the barium studies, it would talk about a spaghetti sign as well as the fact that barium would persist on the small bowel for a long period of time. Here's another case. Look at the patient's small bowel here. Markedly thickened mucosal enhancement, submucosal edema, mainly involving the patient's ileum, but you also could see that the sigmoid colon and rectum and perhaps the cecum are involved. Here's a couple more images. Again, a very nice example showing you very similar to the last case, graft-versus-host disease. So let me just remind you of a few things. Graft-versus-host disease occurs when functionally competent T lymphocytes are introduced into an immunosuppressed recipient. Acute graft-versus-host disease presents within the first 100 days of allergenic bone marrow transplant and is one of the major complications of the procedure. The skin, GI tract, and liver are the principal targeted organs. Symptoms of this disease are often nonspecific but include abdominal cramping, diarrhea, fever, nausea, and vomiting. And you can see this article says it very nicely. Differential diagnosis includes GI infections, neutropenic colitis, and in the early post-transplant period, sequela of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So it's really not a simple diagnosis in that regard. The CT appearance of acute graft-versus-host disease in the GI tract includes bowel wall thickening with or without proximal dilatation, engorgement of the vasorecta, mesenteric fat stranding, mucosal and serosal hyperenhancement. These are exactly the findings we just saw in the two cases I showed you. Now, in terms of wall thickening, uh, we also mentioned the fact that bowel wall involvement is typically very extensive, the prominent mucosal enhancement, and this article by Shimoni gives some very nice pits, pitfalls and also some very nice points. They talk about the water halo sign defined as a line of decreased attenuation within the bowel wall, the accordion sign, but that's in the colon. So those are a few of the key findings. We also should uh, note that pneumatosis can occur with graft-versus-host disease. Then you always worry about ischemic or infarcted bowel, but it could also be due to high-dose steroids or the chemotherapy the patient is on. But fortunately, it's an uncommon finding. Now, when you think about acute abdomen in the oncology patient, there are many causes, right? Small bowel obstruction, large bowel obstruction, ischemia, perforation, tiflitis when it involves the cecum, but also enteritis. And again, think chemotherapy, think radiation therapy, and think graft-versus-host disease. So let's look at a, another finding that may be important. This is a patient who has pancreatic cancer post whipples procedure, had abdominal pain. So you're always worrying about tumor recurrence or maybe adhesions or even a GI bleed, potentially from a GDA stump. But what you see here is thickening of the small bowel. The bowel wall is edematous. There's some prominence in the mesenteric fat. And as we scan downward, you can see that a fairly significant amount of the bowel is involved. Now, perhaps it doesn't look as impressive on the enhancement of the mucosa as the prior case, but as you get additional images, when you catch it just correctly in cross-section, it does show prominent mucosal enhancement. 
you do again see the halo sign. And so if I told you this was graft versus host disease, you would surely be thinking about it. But this patient did not have a bone marrow transplant. This patient had a Whipple's procedure and now is having abdominal pain. Now with a Whipple's procedure, you're involving the region of the portal vein and the SMV and the SMA and the celiac. And so, of course, you could always worry, could a vessel be occluded and now the patient has bowel ischemia. And again, this is distal ileum. Maybe the patient has superimposed Crohn's disease. At least some of these things are coming to your mind. But what exactly is going on in this patient with abdominal pain? Then you have to remember a patient with a Whipple's procedure for pancreatic cancer these days, everyone has had chemotherapy or chemotherapy and radiation therapy pre-op. Patients also will get chemotherapy post-op. So you got to say, aha, this may not be ischemic bowel. The vessels all look good. Infectious etiologies we consider, but that's fairly uncommon. What is giving you this extensive bowel involvement? This is enteritis secondary to chemotherapy. And it's important to realize that abdominal emergencies in cancer patients can result from the underlying malignancy, cancer therapy, or result from the standard pathologies causing acute abdomen in an otherwise healthy population. So we think of everything, but in oncology patients, you gotta think about the treatment. And this article by Morani a year ago made that point very nicely. Here's another example. This patient also had pancreatic cancer, and this was enteritis of the small bowel due to the chemotherapy. Now I will tell you, sometimes I've seen really impressive small bowel involvement, and sometimes even impressive large bowel involvement, and yet the patients are asymptomatic. I'll call the doctor and tell them, but they'll say the patients are asymptomatic. Obviously in other cases, they are very symptomatic. Beautiful example here of long segment involvement. And you see with chemotherapy, you do see more distal involvement rather than proximal involvement. Ilium, which has the fastest uh, reproducing cells, tends to be the most common area involved. Again, the mesenteric vessels are widely patent. With all of these processes, you see increased flow to the bowel, increased enhancement, and so the vasa recta are indeed prominent. And very nicely on the MIP imaging, the vasa recta are patent. The vessel flow to the bowel is patent, but there's increased flow in the vasa recta, and there's this marked enhancement and mucosal irregularity of the small bowel, beautifully shown in this example. Another case, another patient, this one had rectal cancer, but again, the thickening of the small bowel, the prominence of the patient's uh, uh, vessels and bowel, you might consider radiation therapy if the patient had a right-sided a tumor and the patient had radiation to that region, but there was no radiation here. But a prominent vasa recta, beautifully shown in this example. Here it is again. And the thickening of bowel, remember, very similar, that halo, mucosal enhancement, beautiful example of enteritis secondary to the patient's chemotherapy. Now, there are a lot of articles, and you could read this on your own, but just a few points. Chemotherapy-induced enteritis is commonly seen with certain agents like 5-FU and Zolota, which are very common things used in pancreatic cancer, for example. Also, patients often will get multiple therapies. Sometimes patients get oxaliplatin. So it's really hard to be certain what the specific agent is, but with chemotherapy, these effects can be additive. So it can be more uh, problematic. Now, the reason we think we see the diarrhea and these symptoms is related to the direct effect of chemotherapy on rapidly dividing cells in the small bowel mucosa. And that explains why involvement is usually diffuse. So again, several things. Classic chemotherapy targets rapidly proliferating cells. Radiologists may more easily recognize the manifestations of chemotherapy by understanding the mechanisms of action of the chemotherapeutic agents. And the radiologists should be aware that toxicities can be asymptomatic and that radiologists are instrumental in reporting early manifestations of these toxicities to the referring physician. Torisi in this article talked about cytotoxic chemotherapy agents interfering with RNA and DNA synthesis and cell division and therefore affecting cells that grow more rapidly. So 
Almost any agent can cause problems, but as I mentioned, certain agents are more likely to cause problems than others. Chemotherapy-induced enteritis is common with cytotoxic chemotherapy. Again, both symptomatic and asymptomatic pneumatosis have been described with numerous classic chemotherapy agents and have been retarded and been reported with targeted agents as well. In terms of the patient's symptoms, again, the symptoms can be an acute abdomen. Where you can talk about abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, talk about GI bleeding. So it can be difficult from the clinician's perspective. Again, the clinician is always worrying about tumor recurrence, a complication of therapy, and this indeed is one of the complications of therapy. And again, I won't go through the various agents. You can stop the talk here and read the slides if you wanted to uh, more carefully. But these articles do make the point that other entities such as ischemia and radiation enteritis can have a similar appearance. So it's very important to first detect the pathology, but then it'll take some analysis and some Sherlock Holmes work at times to get the right diagnosis. And at times we're not gonna be perfect because what if the patient had chemotherapy and radiation therapy? I'll just mention pneumatosis because when we see pneumatosis, we always worry about ischemic and infarcted bowel. Sometimes with chemotherapy, pneumatosis can be asymptomatic and encountered at routine surveillance imaging. So it's important not to have everyone go crazy if you see pneumatosis. Of course, pneumatosis can mean ischemic bowel, can mean infarcted bowel. But if there's no other signs present, it could just be due to this uh, chemotherapy effect and simply routine follow-up would be necessary. And here's just a nice example of pneumatosis in the patient's small bowel post-chemotherapy, but the patient was essentially asymptomatic and nothing was done for this patient. Now we also talk about GI perforation being related to certain different chemotherapies. So again, when you look carefully and you're thinking about the various agents and their effect and Am I looking at inflammatory disease or infectious disease or chemotherapy related? If you see a perforation, it can be due to many things, but the chemotherapy indeed is one of them. Certain tumors are more likely to bleed with chemotherapy. Things like GIST tumors, which particularly when they're small and in the small bowel do commonly present with bleeding, but after chemotherapy perhaps would even be more likely to bleed. They can bleed, they can ulcerate, and they can perforate. So again, understanding what chemotherapy is used at your institution, what chemotherapy is used for specific problems will help you along getting the right answer. Now, we also spoke about radiation enteritis. And radiation enteritis is something we see a lot less of these days because the fields are better targeted, uh, the doses are better given, and the old days, and in our talks, we talked about radiation hepatitis, radiation involvement of the kidneys, radiation involvement of the spine. We talk about some changes from radiation in patients who had Wilms and neuroblastomas as they get older, including scoliosis, as well as other tumors. But let's do this. Let's stop at this point, and let's pick up part two with radiation enteritis. We'll be right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.